Good morning, everybody. This is Mariana Mitchum with the ATF. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for taking the time out of your extremely busy schedules uh, to tune into the training today. Uh, we will get started with the presentation in just a second. I did want to uh, give you some information moving forward. Uh, the PowerPoint that we'll be going through today is available on our website. I will uh, drop, drop the link to it into the chat box. Um, there's also on our website, you can get a training aid that goes along with the PowerPoint, which has uh, more information. And you can download the regulatory text that we will be talking about today. I highly encourage you to not just read the PowerPoint and the training aid, but actually read the new regulations. Um, additionally, we are recording this training and the recording will be posted at ATF.gov within the next couple of weeks. We are also working on a frequently asked questions list and hope to have that posted as well within the next couple of weeks. Lastly, the chat box today. If you have questions, I encourage you to, to uh, type those into the chat box. Please put as much information as you possibly can as sometimes if they're vague questions, they're hard for us to answer. So if you can be as detailed as possible, that would be great. Um, unfortunately, we will not be able to answer every single question today as some are very fact specific and will require us to reach out to you to get more information. On those questions that we are unable to answer today, you can submit those to FIPB at ATF.gov. And I'll type that uh, email address in here as well. And it is at the end of the presentation. All right, so without further ado, we will go ahead and get started. Jason. Thank you, Mariana. And welcome to the training for final rule 2021R-05F. So what are the reasons for the change? The Justice Department was tasked to amend the federal regulations to, first and foremost, remove and replace regulatory definitions of firearm, frame, or receiver, because the current regulations fail to capture the full meaning of those terms. To clarify the term firearm and gunsmith, and also to provide definitions for certain terms, such as complete weapon, complete muffler or silencer device, multi-piece frame or receiver, privately made firearm, and readily for purposes of clarity due to advancements in firearms technology. Department also amended ATS regulations on marking and record keeping that it deemed necessary to implement these definitions. Effective date of the final rule. The final rule will become effective on August the 24th, 2022. After the notice of proposed rulemaking process was complete, which involved comments from industry members and the public that needed to be considered, the final rule was signed by the Attorney General on April the 11th, 2022. From there, it was published in the Federal Register on April 26th, 2022, which started the 120-day clock that will take us to the August 24th effective date. Goals of this presentation Find that all of the above topics are interrelated in the fact that changes in one area will require changes to another. We'll start with the topic of definitions of firearm frame and receiver led by Bill Ryan, Deputy Chief, Firearms and Ammunition Technology Division. Thank you, Jason, and good morning. It's perhaps helpful to start with just a little bit of history to understand where we are and how we got to where we are. Federal Firearms Act was the predecessor to the Gun Control Act of 1968 and regulated any part or parts of a firearm. During congressional debates in the 1960s, Congress recognized that that was cumbersome and therefore determined that in passing the Gun Control Act of 1968, it would regulate only the most important part of a firearm, that being the firearm frame or receiver. However, Congress did not provide a statutory definition of that term. So in December of 1968, the Department of the Treasury published the final implementing regulations for the GCA that defined firearm frame or receiver as that part of a firearm which provides housing for the hammer, bolt or breech block, and firing mechanism, 
and which is usually threaded at its forward portion to receive the barrel. This has remained the definition in, until this final rule. Now, those three critical components, the hammer, bolt, or breech block, and firing mechanism presented some issues. First, numerous firearms do not even have a hammer. So, for example, striker-fired handguns don't have a hammer, and so no part of that firearm houses the hammer. Second, vast majority of firearms uh, common today, including AR-15s, which we'll touch on in just a second, do not have a single housing for each of those components. In addition, the original definition of frame and receiver lacked analysis as the stage of manufacture at which something becomes regulated as a frame or receiver. Now, it's important to understand that pursuant to the requirements of the Administrative Procedures Act, agencies may publish regulations to implement the statutes um, which they're, to, to which they're, they're delegated. Um, and this is precisely what the Department of the Treasury did in 1968 and precisely what the final rule is now. So, in these regulations, agencies may define terms left undefined in the statute or prescribed rules that are necessary to carry out the provisions of the statute. These definitions or rules may also be amended pursuant to the procedures prescribed in the Administrative Procedures Act. So, these amendments may be promulgated even without change to the underlying statute. So, for example, ATF may define and amend the terms frame or receiver or gunsmith or it may amend regulatory requirements such as the time period for which firearms licensees must maintain firearms transaction records. Next slide. This is an example of what I spoke about on the previous screen. You'll see here the lower picture is the lower assembly or the portion regulated as a receiver of an AR type firearm. It houses the hammer and the firing mechanism and the bolt is maintained in the upper assembly. And so, no one part of the AR or AR, AR variant receivers house all three of the critical components in the current regulatory definition of firearm frame or receiver. Next slide. The final rule includes a, an additional section to the implementing regulation of the Gun Control Act 27 CFR 478.12. This section defines the term frame and it defines the term receiver. These definitions are incorporated in the AECA regulations, Part 447, as well as the NFA implementing regulations, Part 479. These definitions provide greater detail and analysis and account for the diverse modern firearm designs and include analysis on when an item becomes regulated as a frame or receiver. In addition, the final rule defines which part of a firearm silencer is the frame or receiver. Now, if you've had a chance to look at the final rule yet, you'll note that the term frame now refers to that part of a handgun or handgun variants that provide housing or structure for the sear or the equivalent. And that's the part that holds back that energized portion or component, the hammer, the striker, or the bolt, for example. Term receiver means that part of a rifle, shotgun, or variants that provides housing or structure for the bolt, breech block, or other component designed to seal the breech. In addition, both of these terms use the term variant. And so variant is also defined and that refers to a weapon utilizing a similar frame or receiver design, irrespective of, for example, configuration. So, an AR type firearm, whether it's configured as a rifle or whether it's configured as a pistol, the same portion would be considered the receiver. Next slide. Section 478.12 also includes pictures of common weapons and includes which part of those are the frame or the receiver? So, for example, 1911 type handguns, uh, bolt action firearms, uh, break action firearms. These are actual pictures that appear in the regulatory text and the frame or receiver of these types of firearm is clearly defined. The purpose of this is to put the public and the industry on notice which part of a firearm is regulated. Next slide. In addition, the final rule addresses what are known as partially complete, disassembled, or non-functional frames or receivers. What this refers to is those items that were previously marketed as 80% frames or receivers. What this does not mean is that everything that was previously marketed as an 80% receiver is now, a, is, is, is now a regulated firearm. The rule makes clear that those partially completed frames or receivers that are designed to or may readily be completed, assembled, restored, or converted to a functional frame or receiver are regulated. And 
in making this determination, it's also clearly stated in the final rule that the director may consider associated templates, jigs, molds, equipment, tools. And these are items that are sold, distributed, possessed with a kit, or made available by the seller to the person buying that item. And so obviously, this refers to those items previously um, unregulated as 80 or sold as 80% kits. Uh, that will now um, be considered to contain a frame or a receiver. Next slide. Within the regulatory text, there are specific definitions or examples of these definitions that, that are included. And what you're seeing on the screen in front of you now is one of those examples. This refers to those kits mentioned previously. On the left side of your screen, you'll see what is what was previously a firearm that had not reached a stage of manufacture, the critical areas of that AR variant receiver have not been milled, machined, or indexed, but the item is sold with a compatible jig that allows those processes to be readily completed. Such an item would be regulated as a frame or receiver under the final rule. Next slide. In addition, and as an aside, the definition of firearm in the final rule includes an additional clause. This is again separate from the frame or receiver definition. We're talking about the definition of a firearm. This includes a weapons parts kit that is designed to or may readily be completed, assembled, restored, or converted to expel a projectile by the action of explosive. Again, these are all the parts necessary or the majority of the parts necessary to make a functional weapon or convert an item into a functional weapon. This does not refer to those items or kits that were sometimes imported um, in which the frame or receiver of the weapon had been properly and lawfully destroyed, for example, by a cutting torch, removing one quarter inch of material in the critical areas. Again, that does not, this definition within firearm and the final rule does not apply to those items that were properly destroyed. Next slide. Final rule also makes clear that the analysis uh, applies to those items that are clearly identifiable as an unfinished component of a weapon. So those items previously marketed at 80% receivers were identifiable as components of a weapon. This does not include these items such as unformed blocks of metal, liquid polymer, or other raw materials that have not taken such shape. So for example, the block of metal that appears on the screen or in the slide in front of you would not be subject to the analysis in the final rule. Next slide. Another example provided in the regulatory text is a billet or blank of, for example, an AR-15 variant receiver without those critical fire control area, um, or with, with, without the critical cavity, the fire control area milled. This, the picture you see on the screen before you is an example of such a casting. This also does not have the magazine well milled. Um, but the critical portion is still the fire control area. Such an item that's not sold, distributed, or possessed with the instructions or jigs is not regulated as a receiver. Next slide. Final rule provides that the determinations that a partially complete, disassembled, or non-functional frame or receiver, um, and any determinations about those that, that an item had not reached a stage of manufacture are no longer valid or authoritative under the final rule. And so determinations that what was marketed as an 80% frame or receiver or frame or receiver kit has not reached a stage of manufacture, those letters are no longer authoritative. However, it's important to note that things have remained unchanged under the rule as well. Any part of a firearm classified as a frame or receiver prior to publication of the final rule shall continue to be so classified. So, for example, uh, when I spoke earlier about the definition of receiver, I noted that when we're talking about rifles, it's that part that houses the bolt. Obviously, in an AR, that part would be the upper. However, the final rule does not regulate the upper as the receiver of an AR. The lower remains the receiver because of this grandfathering provision. Again, this is spelled out explicitly in the regulatory text. Next slide. This is a picture that appears in the regulation itself. You'll see the bottom picture is the AR variant receiver unassembled, and the top picture is that same receiver assembled into the complete weapon and outlined in red. 
Again, this is to remove all doubt and put everyone on notice, both the industry and the public, about what is the regulated portion of AR variants. Next slide. Final rule also includes other firearms that were previously classified. So, for example, the Ruger Mark IV, the Benelli 121 are specific examples included in the final rule. In addition, consistent with decades of practice in ATF ruling 2010 TAC 3, the right side plate of box type receivers will continue to be the regulated portion, the receiver. So therefore, items like the Vickum, Vickers and Maxim, the Browning 1919, and the M250 caliber machine gun, the right side plate will remain the receiver. This is, again, a picture that appears in the regulatory text, and that right side plate is labeled as the receiver. That's it for my portion. Uh, turning it over to uh, Mike Knapp from FIPB. Uh, good morning, everybody. As Bill said, my name is Mike Knapp, and I am a farms enforcement specialist in the Farms Industries Programs Branch. And in this section, I will be speaking specifically about privately made firearms or PMFs. Next slide. The final rule created a new term in the regulations to implement the Gun Control Act or GCA, and the Arms Export Control Act, often referred to as the AECA. That term is privately made firearm and the associated acronym of PMF. The GCA defines the term in 27 CFR 47811. The AECA defines the term in 44711 as having the same meaning as found in part 478. So the AECA simply references the GCA definition. So uh, what is a PMF? A PMF is a firearm, including a frame or receiver, completed, assembled, or otherwise produced by a person other than a licensed manufacturer and without a serial number placed by a licensed manufacturer at the time the firearm was produced. There are some exceptions which we'll cover shortly, but as a federal firearms licensees, uh, the final rule requires that you identify or mark any PMF that you take into your inventory. This will allow licensees to comply with the GCA record keeping requirements when accepting PMFs, and therefore it will allow ATF to trace those PMFs through licensees records if they are involved in a crime and recovered. Next slide. So let's look at what the final rule does not do. Uh, it does not prohibit an individual from making their own PMF, nor does it mandate an unlicensed person mark their PMF in any way. It does not require licensees to accept unmarked PMFs into their inventory if they do not wish to. The final rule does not apply to markings required pursuant to the NFA upon approval of an ATF Form 1. And the final rule does not apply to firearms manufactured or made before the effective date of the Gun Control Act, which is October 22nd, 1968, unless that firearm is remanufactured on or after the effective date of the GCA. Uh, what that last paragraph means, or that last statement means is, if you have a pre-68 firearm in your inventory that does not have a manufacturer's applied serial number, this ruling does not require you to apply any kind of serial number to that firearm that was made prior to 1968. Next slide. The final rule amends 411 pertaining to the definition of the term engaged in the business rel relative to a gunsmith. The term is amended in several respects, but specific to PMFs, the term is amended to include persons who engage in the business of marking PMFs. Therefore, any person intending to engage in a business of marking PMFs must be licensed as a dealer gunsmith. This amendment will allow licensees greater access to professional marking services. Next slide. As stated previously, all licensees who take PMFs into inventory are required to mark each PMF with an individual serial number. The serial number will be comprised of the licensee's abbreviated FFL number which is the first three and last five digits of your FFL number, immediately followed by a hyphen or dash, and, and then followed by a unique identification number specific to that PMF. Licensees must mark an individual seal number on a PMF no later than seven days upon receipt or before the date of disposition, whichever is sooner. 
Uh, this brings us to the marking of a polymer frames and receivers. ATF has long held that placing a serial number directly into polymer does not meet marking requirements since such serial numbers would be susceptible to being readily obliterated, altered, or removed. So the final rule amends uh, 27 CFR 47892 and explains that an acceptable method of identifying a polymer frame PMF is by placing a serial number on a metal plate that is permanently embedded into a polymer frame receiver or another marking method, which is approved by the director. Please be aware that a licensee is not required to mark a PMF receipt for same day adjustment or repair that is returned to the person from whom it, whom it is received. However, if the adjustment or repair is not completed on the same day and the FFL keeps the PMF overnight, the PMF must be recorded in the licensee's a and record and must be marked with a serial number within seven business days and before it is returned to the customer. Notably, marking serial numbers on PMF is a customization and the return of a repaired or customized firearm to the person from whom it was received does not require an ATF form 4473. However, it does require an AD entry. Next slide. Occasionally, FFLs will encounter PMFs that a non licensee has marked with a unique identification number or, from the non licensee's perspective, a serial number. For example, non licensees may be required by state law to mark their PMFs. The final rule amends 47892 to allow for the adoption of a, of a unique identification number. If a unique identification number marked on a PMF complies with 47892, meaning that it meets the depth and size requirements and is not stamped directly onto the polymer, FFLs may prefix such existing unique identification numbers with their abbreviated FFL number, which again is the first three and last five digits of the FFL number, immediately followed by a hyphen or a dash, and immediately followed by the already marked unique identification number that the non-licensee placed on the firearm. Please be aware every serial number a licensee marks on a PMF must be unique and may not be duplicated on any other firearm the licensee marks. So for example, if the non-licensee had put uh, 01 as their identification number and the FFL holders already marked a PMF with a 01, they would not be able to adopt that, uh, that number. So that means that an FFL is going to have to be mindful of all the serial numbers they have used or marked on a PMF. Next slide. So now let's talk a little bit about the time frame in which PMFs must be marked. As a reminder, the final rule is effective on August 24th, 2022. Accordingly, PMFs in the FFL's inventory on or after August 24th, 2022 must be marked even if acquired before that date. Prior to August 24th, 2022, FFLs may choose to mark PMFs themselves or contract out marking services to a gunsmith. However, PMFs acquired before August 24th, 2022 that are in an FFL's inventory on August 24th must be marked within 60 days of the effective date, which would be October 23rd, 2022. Although FFLs have until October 23rd to mark PMFs acquired before the effective date, such PMFs must be properly marked before they may be transferred. For example, a licensee receives a PMF on August 1st and the FFL intends to transfer it on September 1st. The PMF must be marked before it can be transferred. Keeping with the same example, if a PMF is acquired on August 1st and the FFL intends to transfer it on October 30th, the FFL must mark the PMF by October 23rd and record the serial number in his or her A&D record. PMFs acquired after August 20, 24th must be marked within seven days of receipt or before the date of disposition, whichever is sooner. FFLs may contract out PMF marking services only if the person performing such marking services is doing so under the direct supervision of the requesting FFL. What that means is if you are going to take that firearm to somebody else to market for you, you can't leave it with them and come back later for it. You're going to have to stay there while that person marks it. Next slide. So let's uh, refresh on a few things. And FFLs must mark a PMF in accordance with 47892 only if they take that PMF into inventory. So if somebody brings you a PMF and says, please mark this for me, 
you can tell them, hey, I'm not doing that. You need to take that out of my store and you're not required to take it into inventory. You're not required to market. Uh, FFLs that are handling a private party PMF transfer must record the farm into their AD records and must mark the PMF. FFLs that do not have the capability to mark PMFs taken into inventory may have another person, licensee or non-licensee, mark those PMFs. Any person, licensee or non-licensee, who marks a PMF for the original FFL who received that PMF may only mark the PMF on the spot under the direct supervision of the original FFL who is taking the PMF into inventory and recording its acquisition in their AD record. And there, that person is going to mark the PMF with the original licensee's abbreviated FFL number in accordance with 478.92. In addition, a licensee who marks a PMF for the original FFL who received the PMF shall not log that PMF into its records. As stated earlier, an individual who devotes time, attention, and labor to placing marks of navigation on a privately made firearm as a regular course of trade or business with the principal objective of livelihood and profit must be licensed as a gunsmith. So if you're a trophy shop and you incidentally have a handful of PMF brought to you in a year where people want you to market for them, we're not gonna require you to get a, an FFL. But if you're gonna advertise your services and say, hey, if you bring your PMF to me, I'll market for a fee, you're gonna have to have a type one FFL be licensed as a gunsmith. Uh, we need to stress, in no case may the original licensee dispose of an unmarked PMF until the farm is properly marked and the serial number is recorded in the original licensee's records. Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about record, record keeping as it pertains to PMFs. We'll look at a &D records first. So to reiterate, except for a PMF received for same day adjustment or repair and return to the person from whom received, FFLs must record the acquisition of a PMF by the close of the next business day following receipt of the firearm. Uh, it's important to note that applying a serial number to a PMF is not an adjustment or, or repair, that's a customization. And if somebody brings you a PMF for custom, to get the serial number put on it, you're going to have to log that into your AD record and mark it as required. Uh, you're not allowed to mark it with a serial with a with the serial number and return it to the same person without putting it in your A D records. Regarding the A D serial number, if the PMF received is not already marked with a serial number by a licensee pursuant to the final rule, then the licensee is going to have to check is going to leave the serial number portion of the A D record blank until the PMF is properly marked. However, licensees must mark PMFs within seven days of receipt or prior to disposition, whichever comes first. If marked before the seventh day, licensees must update the AD record once the PMF is marked. So when you first take it in, you're going to put it as no serial number. And if three days later you apply the serial number, at that point you're going to go back to the AD entry and you're going to put in the serial number that you that you applied to the firearm. Regarding firearm description, the final rule also amends record keeping requirements to allow licensees to record privately made firearm or PMF in the disposition of firearm section. Formerly, you, were, you either had to put the license manufacturer or the license importer's name in that block. Now, and now if it's a PMF, you can simply put PMF as the manufacturer. Next slide. Lastly, as with AMD record keeping, the final rule amended 478.124 to allow licensees to record privately made firearm or PMF on the ATF form 4473 as the name of the manufacturer of the firearm. And that's the end of my section. I'm going to pass it back to Bill Ryan. Thanks, Mike. I'm going to touch on marking requirements. Next slide. Perhaps be no surprise to anyone on the phone that the purpose of the final rule or the intended purpose of the final rule is to increase the successful traces of firearms used in criminal activities. The idea is that more thorough marking, more thorough record keeping results in better tracing. Also, as everyone knows, licensed manufacturers and importers are required by federal law, by the statute itself, to identify each firearm it manufactures or imports by placing a serial number on the frame of receiver. 
In addition, the implementing regulations, section 478.92, require that additional information be placed on the firearm, including model, caliber gauge, name, city, and state of the manufacturer or importer. Although these additional markings currently can be placed on the frame receiver or in the barrel or on the side of a pistol as applicable. Next slide. Under the final rule, however, licensed manufacturers and importers must mark the firearm, the frame or receiver, with a serial number, name of the licensee, and the city and state of the place of business. Again, that must be on the frame or receiver per the final rule. Those name, city, state markings can no longer be placed on the barrel or pistol slide. Now, there is an important caveat to this. Um, specifically, current markings or current uh, currently permitted markings are grandfathered on all firearms of, of the same design. We'll touch on that in just a minute. Um, so before everyone um, circles this, marks it down as uh, changing their markings, it, it's just know there is, there is a caveat. In addition, the final rule sets out model, caliber, gauge, and other markings may be placed on the frame receiver, barrel, or pistol slide. The final rule provides two options for marking this information. Frame or receiver may ha must have an individual serial number and either one of the following, name of the FFL and city and state as is currently required, or name of the FFL and that abbreviated FFL number. You can see the citations for this on the screen in front of you. And then of course there are size and height and depth markings for uh, this information as well. And again, the citations on the screen. Next slide. Final rule defines something known as a multi-piece frame or receiver, and that's in section 478.12. Multi-piece frame or receiver refers to a frame or receiver that may be disassembled into some parts, but that means a standardized units that can be replaced and exchanged. This does not include those internal frames of the SIG type pistols as specifically called out in 478.12. For multi-piece frames or receivers, the requirements regarding individual serial numbers vary. So when you have one of these frames or receivers that can be broken down into parts itself, uh, and there's more than one outermost component that qualifies, all parts must be marked with the same serial number if sold together as a complete modular frame or receiver. However, if one part is sold individually or independently, uh, it must be marked with a unique serial number pursuant to the final rule. Next slide. The regulation also sets out the way that multi-piece frames or receivers must be identified. The outermost housing or structure that is designed to hold the critical component um, or the um, outermost component of a firearm sounds or muffler, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Uh, that is the part that must be marked, that outermost component. If more than one of those parts is similarly designed to hold or contain such, such component, then each of the subparts must be identified, as I stated. And these parts are, um, are presumed to be part of the frame or receiver. Next slide. See what I'm talking about on this slide. So the top picture is a typical AR type receiver looking down into the fire control cavity as well as the magazine well. Obviously the top picture is a one piece. Something that has been seen or we've witnessed a little more of uh, recently is those modular receivers in which it's a typical receiver, but it's broken down into left and right sides or right and left halves or even front and back or even into quadrants. This, this is an example, the left and right side of a modular receiver that each side houses the critical components. And so when sold together, each side must be serialized and marked. Next slide. Once these modular subparts of these multi-piece frames or receivers have been marked and put together, it's unlawful to remove and dispose of one of those parts because removal would be a violation of 922K under the final rule and then the um, similar requirements under the NFA should, should the NFA apply. Marked parts can be removed or replaced if the subpart is not itself a firearm under the NFA. The original manufacturer identifies the replacement part with a serial number as prescribed in the final rule, and the replaced part is then destroyed by that original manufacturer or under the direct supervision of that manufacturer. As I said before, a multi-piece frame or receiver, a part that is sold separately, uh, requires that it be identified. 
Next slide. The final rule also defines what part of a firearm muffler or a firearm silencer is the frame or receiver. That's defined as the outer tube that provides housing or structure for the primary internal component designed to reduce the sound. Right? And so for silencers, what we're talking about is the expansion chamber. That expansion chamber typically houses the baffles or baffling material. There are examples of what are referred to as modular firearm silencers. And these are devices with more than one part that has an expansion chamber or houses baffles. These are sometimes marketed uh, to, um, to um, customers as items that can be used all together to make one complete full device or silencer, or each individual part may be used independently to create a smaller silencer, depending on the shooter's needs. We'll talk about that in just a second in a little more detail. Term shall not include the removal end cap. And so the end cap is not the portion that's the frame or receiver. It is not the portion that may be marked under the final rule. Next slide. This is an example of the modular silencers I just spoke of. Picture on the top is the complete device with all the parts and pieces put together. The lower is that same device just broken apart. And so as you can see, the principal housing that attaches to the weapon that expels a projectile, so that part that attaches to the pistol or the rifle is the part that should be marked under the final rule. If there's more than one part, so two or three parts of that modular silencer, each may be used independently, each may be attached to the um, weapon that expels a projectile, then each must be marked under the um, provisions and guidance in the final rule. Next slide. As I stated, the end cap is not the frame or receiver. In addition, the final rule um, formalizes a uh, previous practice, and that is that minor components of silencers need not be registered, engraved, marked um, when transferred between FFL special occupational taxpayers. So, for example, transfer of K baffles, as you see there on the screen, the internal components of a silencer not be registered marked um, if they are transferred between special occupational taxpayers. However, any such item transferred outside to an individual, all the rules of the GCA and the NFA still apply. That is still a silencer that must be registered, marked, and properly transferred under those statutes. Next slide. There should be few circumstances in which more than one unique serial number is placed on a weapon. And as we'll talk about in just a minute, there are examples. Um, in specific instances in which markings may be adopted. In addition, the definition of transfer in Part 479, the NFA implementing regulations, now excludes temporary conveyances that are made for repair or research, testing, et cetera. This is based on the statutory definition of transfer under the National Firearms Act, which talks about and requires a disposition, a disposing of that item. So an item that is just temporarily conveyed and expected to be returned is not a transfer, and that is explicitly stated in the implementing regulations now. And as I said before, um, again, the final rule allows those internal components of silencers to be transferred among qualified SOTs just for the purposes of further manufacture or repair uh, without being marked and registered in the National Firearms Registry and Transfer Record. Next slide. In addition, there are time limits for marking firearms now explicitly included in the regulation. GCA firearms must be marked within seven days after completion of the manufacturing process. NFA firearms must be marked by the close of the next business day. That's a function of the registration time frame um, required of special occupational taxpayers to register an NFA firearm on an ATF form two. Obviously it makes sense if it must be Registered by the end of the next business day, marking is an important part of that registration, so it must be marked by the end of the next business day. Next slide. There are exceptions to marking requirements, and this is the adoption of the markings that I talked about before. There are specific instances set out in detail in the regulatory text. Um, so markings may be adopted uh, for newly manufactured firearms when a firearm has not been sold, shipped, or otherwise disposed of to a person other than a licensee, and obviously the serial number is not duplicated. So those newly manufactured firearms that haven't gone outside that FFL chain, um, those, those markings may be adopted. 
When the licensee remanufactures or imports a firearm that was previously sold, shipped, or disposed of to a non-licensee, that, that licensee may adopt some markings, um, but must also uh, include their name, city, and state, or, the, or their name and the letters FFL, and then the abbreviated Federal Firearms Licensee Number, as explicitly, again, set out in the final rule. And when a manufacturer performs uh, gunsmithing services on a firearm, must be on an existing firearm that's for a non-licensee and not for sale or di distribution. In those instances, markings are not required. Next slide. These are the marking grandfathering provisions I mentioned before. The final rule explicitly allows manufacturers and imports to continue to mark firearms with the same design in the same way they did before the effective date of the rule. Okay, so effectively, most all firearms that ATF previously cla classified or were lawfully being made uh, may be marked the same way. So this does not require that um, once the effective date of the ruling comes, every manufacturer now mark serial number as well as the name, city, and state on the receiver itself. Uh, marking on the slide or the barrel for example, will continue to be permitted under this specific grandfather clause. This does not apply to items such as previously marketed as 80% receivers or 80% kits. Um, those determinations about stage of ma manufacture, those are not great grandfathered. So someone who was producing previously an item marketed as an 80% kit um, is not is is not subject to this grandfathering pro provision because those firearms will now need to be marked if they satisfy the definition of frame or receiver in the final rule. Next slide. Going to turn over the record keeping requirements uh, to uh, Gary Griffin from FIPB. Hey, thanks, Bill. Hello, uh, my name is Gary Griffin. I'm a firearms enforcement specialist with the uh, firearms industry program branch. And I'll be talking about record keeping requirements and record retention requirements. Next slide. So the final rule requires all importers and manufacturers cons to consolidate their records, which means they can no longer maintain a separate disposition record for the activity conducted. So prior to the final rule, the regulations required manufacturers to maintain a set maintain separate sets of records for the activity conducted, meaning one set for firearms manufacturer, including quantity, another set for firearms transfer to other licensees, and even a separate set for transfers to non-licensees. And this requirement was the same for importers. There have been rulings in place to allow manufacturers and importers to consolidate their records for the activity I described into a single record instead of multiple sets. And really almost almost everybody maintains it that way in a consolidated manner. So this really won't be much of a change for most of you. Um, so um, the amended reg regulations now requires that um, the consolidation of records and there will no longer be an option for multiple sets. So for clarity, the new rule is not, and I do repeat, is not requiring the consolidation of records between FFLs and in no case should a company that has both a manufacturer's license and an importer's license combine their records together. This also um, brought on questions from dealers asking, can they continue to maintain um, separate records if they have one license where they may have want to maintain a set for uh, repairs, maybe a set for long guns and, and handguns. Um, so this, this final rule does not change that. You can continue to have paper records. Um, one FFL can have paper records uh, they, uh, if they want to separate it in that manner. So the new regulations require that all licensees eliminate duplicate entries. And what that means is if a licensee happens to record a duplicate entry, where uh, uh, whether to close out an old record book for any, or for any other reason, the licensee will need to record the date and location of the subsequent entry as the disposition. And what that would look like, uh, for example, um, the closeout entry would show the date of entry, perhaps a book number, page number, and line number as the disposition. The final rule 
clarifies that dealers, manufacturers, and importers may conduct same-day adjustment and repairs without recording the firearm into the A&D record, so long as that firearm is being returned to the same person. Next slide. So manufacturers are required to record the acquisition of GCA firearms manufacturers or otherwise acquired within seven days or prior to the dispos disposition, whichever comes first. Whenever there is more than one manufacturer or importer, country of manufacture, or serial number marked on a firearm, the licensee is required to record all of the markings in the A&D record. Any FFL number marked on a firearm as part of the serial number must be recorded in the serial number column of the A&D record. And for tracing purposes, each serial number must be separated by a semicolon in cases where there's more than one serial number present. With the exception of same day repairs or adjustments returned to the same person, all firearms acquired by an FFL must be recorded as an acquisition. Next slide, please. Manufacturers must record NFA firearms in the AD records by the close of the next business day, unless the manufacturer has a commercial record of acquisition, which will extend that entry requirement until the seventh day. Manufacturers may delay the submission of an ATF Form 2 notice of firearms manufactured or imported if, number one, if the silencer parts are transferred between qualified licensees for further manufacture, or two, the complete silencer devices that will be registered, to complete silencer devices that will be registered um, upon completion or three, to repair existing registered devices. In cases where the FFL SOT manufacturer has transferred silencer parts to another qualified FFL SOT manufacturer for further manufacture, i.e. manufacturing, coding, et cetera, or manufacturing a complete muffler or silencer device, the manufacturer who completes the device would be responsible for identifying recording and registering it. FFL SOT manufacturers may transfer a replacement part defined as a silencer, and that would be other than a frame or receiver, to another FFL SOT licensee without identifying or registering such part if the purposes are for repair and it is and it has previously been registered in accordance to the regulation. Next slide. Now, regarding records retention, the final rule requires that all licensees retain all required records until the license is discontinued. AD records must be kept on paper or in an approved electronic format at the license premises and is accessible for inspection. A warehouse may be used to store paper records older than 20 years of age. But that warehouse would be subject to inspection and cannot be used to conduct firearms related business activities uh, without obtaining a separate license. Licensees can no longer send records older than 20 years to the out of business records center, uh, which is under the National Tracing Center. They can only submit their records upon, upon discontinuance of the license. Next slide. So now we're on to uh, rulings and procedures affected presented by Jennifer Scott. Thank you, Gary. Good morning, everyone. Um, as uh, Gary mentioned, I'm Jennifer Scott. I'm a firearms enforcement specialist in the firearms industry programs branch. I will be covering the rulings and procedure that are affected by this final rule. And just so everyone is aware, the reason ATF publishes formal rulings and procedures is to promote uniform understanding and application of the laws and regulations we administer. Most of the material already discussed will also be discussed and reviewed here again in this section. And the reason for that is because the many changes of the final rule, those changes must also be made to previously published rulings and the procedure. There are 15 rulings and one procedure that have been either superseded, clarified, 
or amplified by this final rule. Next slide, please. First, we will discuss the rulings that are superseded. There are seven of them. Superseded is used to describe a situation where the position set forth in a prior ruling is displaced and rendered ineffective by the rule. First, we have ruling 2009-1, which was the firearms manufacturing activities, camouflaging or engraving firearm. This ruling stated that any person who engaged in the business of camouflaging or engraving firearms must be licensed as a dealer. Then we have ruling 2010-10, manufacturing operations may be performed by licensed gunsmiths under certain conditions. This ruling stated that an 01 gunsmith who performed activities on behalf of manufacturers or importers did not have to obtain an 07 license under certain conditions. As previously discussed, the regulations now provide the definition of gunsmith. Because of such, the final purpose of activities being performed will determine whether a type 01 or 07 license is required. And the important part to remember here is if the activity is performed as part of the production of a new or remanufactured firearm for, for sale or distribution, then O type 07 manufacturer's license is required. And I'm gonna give you a couple examples here. So we have an O1 dealer gunsmith who camouflages firearms for a type 07 licensee. Currently, an O1 license is sufficient. However, post uh, final rule, which becomes effective August 24th, a manufacturer's license is now going to be required if the firearms are manufactured by completion, assembly, or applying coatings or otherwise making them suitable for use i.e. for sale or distribution. Also under ruling 2010-10, um, another example would be an 01 licensee blues, anodizes, powder coats, plates, polishes, or does heat or chemical treatment for a type 07 licensee. Currently, the type 01 is sufficient. However, under the final rule, um, an 07 is going to be needed to um, because if the firearms are manufactured by completion assembly or applying or otherwise making them suitable for use again for sale or distribution for sale or distribution is your key terms here um, if you are a gunsmith and you are doing the work for a uh, non-licensees and the firearms are not going to be held for sale or distribution then an O1 dealer gunsmith license is still sufficient. Um, however, take note that if you're doing any type of seracoding, bluing, uh, camouflaging, any of that, and they're, you're doing it on behalf of another licensee, then and they will be held for sale or distribution, then you would need to get a type 07 license now. Next slide, please. ATF ruling 2009-5 is firearms manufacturing activities, identification markings of firearms. The 09-5 was a non-marking variance request or notice um, that the licensees provided to ATF. The notice is no longer required under the amended regulations under certain circumstances. As previously mentioned, the amended regulations specifically state when and how a licensee may adopt existing markings. There are three ways. The first one is when a firearm that has not been sold, shipped, or otherwise disposed of to a person other than a licensee. So if it is still inside the licensee realm of moving from one licensee to another and it has not gone out of um, the licensee realm, that they, it can be uh, the licensee must adopt both the serial number and other identifying markings, provided the serial number is not duplicated on any other firearm. Next slide, please. Number two, the second way, when a licensee remanufactures or imports a firearm that was previously sold, shipped, or disposed of to a non-licensee, 
And number three is when a manufacturer performs a service for a non licensee as a gunsmith on an existing firearm that is not for sale or distribution. Next slide, please. ATF ruling 2012-1 is the time period for marking firearms manufactured. The, the regulations now require that all complete GCA firearms outside of the NFA realm must be marked within seven days after completion of the manufacturing process or prior to disposition, whichever comes first. Next slide, please. ATF ruling 2013-3 is the adopting identification of firearms. The regulations allow manufacturers and importers who remanufacture or import firearms to adopt an existing serial number, caliber gauge, model, or other markings already identified on a firearm, provided they legibly and conspicuously place or cause to be placed on the frame or receiver either one of two items. First is the name of FFL and their city and state, just like it's always been. Uh, however, you have another option, which is the name of the FFL and their abbreviated FFL number, the first three and last five digits with no dashes individually and not as a prefix to the serial number adopted. Next slide, please. Next is ATF ruling 2011-1, the importers consolidated records. This ruling um, as Gary mentioned, he talked about the record keeping requirements. This ruling allowed importers to consolidate their records instead of having to keep the multiple records. Um, however, as Gary mentioned, separate records are no longer allowed. Instead, the amended regulations require that all impo the importers must re uh, records must be combined into one record. Therefore, you don't have an acquis one acquisition record and disposition to licensees and non-licensees. It's all into one record. Next is ATF ruling 2016-3, the consolidation of records required for manufacturers. Again, this ruling allowed manufacturers to consolidate their records, what most all of uh, everyone is doing anyway. However, those separate records, if there are any licensees that were still keeping the separate records, those separate records are no longer allowed. All manufacturers' records must be combined into one record. And again, to reiterate, this is not to consolidate and combine manufacturers and importers' records into one set of records if you hold both of those licenses. Each licensee is responsible for keeping their own separate records. Um, note, if you have not done so, um, in, uh, you need, we would highly recommend that you review the Federal Register. There are specific tables that are included um, that will be recruited, recruited in the regulations, and they are now already in the Federal Register. Table 1 is specifically a table to importers or manufacturers. It is to be used for importers or manufacturers, again, not to be combined, uh, but take a look at those that um, you will need to adjust your headers and headings of your required um, uh, regulations A and D books. Uh, also, um, yes. uh, we will provide a link to the end of this presentation uh, that has the, the Federal Register to it. Next slide, please. Next, we will discuss the rulings that are amplified. There are three of them. Amplified is where a prior published position is being extended to apply a new fact pattern or situation. ATF ruling 2002-6, identification of firearms, armor piercing ammunition, and large capacity ammunition feeding devices. The regulations amplify the terms conspicuously and legibly to explain how they apply to the markings of frames or receivers, including multi-piece frames and receivers and modular silencer devices. Note, however, the ruling still applies in all other respects. Next slide, please. ATF ruling 2016-1, requirements to keep firearms records electronically. The regulations just amplify this ruling to explain that A and D records over 20 years of age may be maintained electronically and cannot be destroyed. 
However, again, all other aspects of this ruling still apply. ATF ruling 2016-2 is the electronic 4473. Same thing, regulations amplify to explain that 4473s over 20 years of age may be maintained electronically. However, they cannot be destroyed. And again, all other aspects still apply to this ruling. Next slide, please. Finally, we will discuss the rulings and procedure that are clarified. There are five rulings and one procedure. Clarified is where the language in a prior ruling procedure is being made clear because the existing language may cause confusion. First, we have revenue ruling 55-342, FFL's assembling firearms from component parts. The regulations clarify that a gunsmith must obtain a manufacturer's license when the activity is conducted on a firearm for purposes of for sale or distribution. ATF ruling 77-1 is gunsmithing at shooting ranges. The regulations now clarify that not only gunsmiths, but manufacturers and importers may also perform same day adjustments or repairs uh, and return the firearm to the person from whom received without making an acquisition entry into their A&D records. Then we have ruling 2009-2, installation of drop-in replacement parts. This ruling stated that gunsmiths who engage in the business of installing drop-in replacement parts must be licensed as dealers. However, now the regulations clarify that dealer gunsmiths may install drop-in replacement parts to repair their own firearms or to repair firearms for other licensees who plan to resell them, all without being licensed as a manufacturer. In addition, the regulation also clarifies that a dealer gunsmith may repair or customize customer-owned firearms, which includes using drop-in replacement parts. Next slide, please. ATF ruling 2010-3, identification of maximum side plate receivers. The regulations clarify that the classification of the right side plate of Vicker Maxim receiver is grandfathered and may continue to be marked on the right side plate unless the receiver is redesigned. Ruling 2015-1 is manufacturing and gunsmithing. Again, the regulations provide the definition of gunsmith, and because of such, the purpose for which the activity is being performed will determine what type of license is required. The rule further clarifies when a manufacturer's license is required. Also, dealer gunsmiths must be licensed as manufacturers when they perform work that produces or remanufactures firearms for sale or distribution. So for those licensees that hold a type 01 license, you may want to look at your operations and um, determine if you are a manufacturer, if you're doing gunsmithing work that was maybe held under this ruling or 2010-10, um, if you, if those firearms are going to be held for sale or distribution, then you would need to obtain an 07 license. Next slide, please. And lastly, ATF procedure 2020-1 is the record keeping procedure for non over the counter sales, uh, firearm sales by licensees to unlicensed in state residents that are NICS exempt. The regulations now clarify that the procedure is no longer an alternate method of complying with 27 CFR 478.124F. The regulation also no longer requires that the firearm description information be completed after the FFL receives a completed 4473 from the transferee. And this is because of the new formatting of the um, last and most current 4473 where the firearm information is first. And last, the procedure must still be followed whenever non-over-the-counter transactions are conducted in accordance with section 478.96b. This concludes my portion of the training. I will now turn it back over to Jason. Thank you, Jen. Uh, just going over a couple of things here, we just have some online resources for you. Um, the definition of frame for receiver and identification of firearms that is listed on the ATF uh, website there. You'll also be able to find this PowerPoint presentation and a trading aid, which can uh, 
help you all very well with this. Um, also, I've noticed the e-regulation site um, listed here. This has all the current federal firearms regulations, and it will be updated as well once the rule becomes effective. You can print any uh, sheet here or regulation here that you need. Um, here's, you have the rulemaking and federal regulation sites as well. For any questions regarding this presentation or any questions that you did uh, weren't covered um, under this final rule training, feel free to email us at FIPB at ATF.gov with the subject line frame or receive your final rule. We will get back to you as soon as possible. For any technical questions, feel free to contact the Firearms and Ammunition Technology Division. And for questions on the rulemaking process, please contact the Office of Regulatory Affairs. We'll now look at some of the questions in that box. All right, uh, real quick, everybody, I, I post the links that, that Jason was just referring to in the chat box, the PowerPoint, the training aid, and the regulatory text, uh, so you can use those links as well. Um, there is going to be another session this afternoon beginning at 2 p.m. Eastern. It is the exact same link that you use to get into this current training site. So if you made it into this one, but you made it in late and you would like to join the afternoon session, it is this link that you are using right now. That class will begin at 2 p.m. Eastern. All right, going over the questions that were submitted in the chat box, I'm going to try and group them together by topic. Uh, we'll start with PMF related questions first. All right, uh, the first question is, does the type of FFL matter when it comes to marking the PMF? For instance, uh, do you need a type one to mark PMF versus a type seven? I think the question is actually specifically about the licensing requirement. If you are a non-licensee and you intend to engage in the business of marking PMFs, you must be licensed as a dealer gunsmith. With that being said, FFL types 1, 2, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11 can all perform gunsmithing services, meaning they can mark PMFs. So if I am currently not an FFL, I am not licensed, but I have the, the tools and equipment to mark firearms, and I'm just going to do it occasionally. I'm not engaged in the business. I don't need a license for that. Correct? That is correct. Okay. All right, next question. Uh, on the other person's marking PMFs for FFLs, you state you must be licensed as a dealer gunsmith. Is this intended to mean that an 07 manufacturer cannot mark 07s? And I just covered this in the previous response. An 07 can engage in gunsmithing. So they, an 07 can mark a PMF. Absolutely. Perfect. All right, next question. Um, and so I, I think this is, uh, I think the question uh, is relating to PMFs, but we can talk about it from both PMFs and just uh, uh, commercially manufactured firearms. So what if the customization in question takes less than 24 hours, presuming they're talking about someone bringing in a firearm for customization. So the the repair of a repair or customization of a firearm that is returned to the individual from whom it was received does not require an ATF, 44, ATF form 4473 in a background check. However, it requires an A and D entry. It doesn't matter if it came in for 10 minutes or if it came overnight. It has it has to be logged into the A and D record. A PMF that is a, P, a PMF that is marked with a serial number that is a customization. So if you're marking a PMF same day, it goes into your A and D record, and you return it to your customer without a forty four seventy three. Uh, another PMF record keeping question: Would an A and D PMF book for record keeping make it easier to audit? So presuming they're asking. Can I keep a book just for PMFs? I would say if you're going to be doing a lot of PMF markings, you, you can certainly do that. There's, there's nothing that prohibits the licensee from maintaining multiple A&D books. Keep in mind, the final rule prescribes new formats for how that A&D record needs to look. But if you want to maintain a separate PMF A&D book, an NFA A&D book, a handgun A&D book, you may do so. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, if you mark a PMF for a customer as a gunsmith or dealer, does that make you the manufacturer of the firearm? No, it does not. And there were some uh, liability questions associated with this particular question, and, and we cannot answer anything related to liability that is um, outside of uh, what we are enforcing. 
maybe it might just be helpful to remind the licensees the reasons for marking these PMS is for traceability purposes. So should these firearms be recovered and ATF traces them, that marking on it will allow us to contact that licensed gunsmith and, and, and obtain the information in terms of who's that firearm, who is the owner of that firearm. So it's all about tracing. That's why we need those markings on those firearms. All right, next question. Uh, when marking PMFs, do we have to put FFL and then their five or their eight digits uh, and then the unique number, or is it just the actual eight digits of the FFL number and the unique? Essentially, they're asking, do they have to actually engrave the letters FFL? No, the regulations state that you must engrave your abbreviated FFL number, which is the first three and last five digits of your license number, followed by a hyphen, and then followed by a unique identification number. You will not engrave the letters FFL. There is a provision in the remanufactured or imported firearms pro provision that, that lists differently what must be done there. So there shouldn't be confusion about these two different scenarios. Again, if you read the regulation, the regulatory text itself, it expl is explicitly sets out those differences and you have to follow the rules under which your particular circumstance is at that time. Right, so on a PMF, if you are marking a PMF, you do not have to engrave the letters FFL. All right, exactly. Specific to PMFs, you do not engrave the letters FFL. All right. Uh, if an O1 FFL gunsmith receives a PMF in for repair that has a 100% manufactured, serialized, and marked receiver, is the gunsmith required to put their abbreviated FFL number into the firearm before returning it to the customer? No, they are not. As, again, the key thing here, as long as it was manufactured by a licensed manufacturer, so you would need to know exactly what you're looking at. So, for instance, if someone took a uh, commercially manufactured receiver uh, and that receiver was pro properly marked by the manufacturer and then the, the individual built out the rest of the firearm and then they brought it in for gunsmithing, that does not require the FFL to put a serial number on it. That's correct. That is not a PMF. Because it was commercially manufactured. That is okay. correct. Right, sorry, everyone trying to sort through these questions, make sure we got all the PMF questions answered. Um, all right, so a record keeping question, Lindsay. Uh, the question is, I don't need to consolidate my Title I and Title II A&D books, correct? There's been a lot of confusion with this, frankly speaking. The consolidation of records pertains to license type. So if you are a Type 07 licensee, as a manufacturer, we had a ruling that allowed you to consolidate the three different types of records that you were required to keep, a record of acquisition or manufacturer, record of disposition to non-licensees, and record of disposition to licensees. So we allowed you to consolidate those records. Under the final rule, you are now required to consolidate those records. So if you're an importer or a manufacturer, those records are consolidated. Great, thank you. All right, uh, got some um, questions concerning whether or not you need to be a gunsmith or a manufacturer. So we'll go over to those now. Uh, first question, if a gunsmith receives a 100% serialized manufactured AK receiver from a customer, along with the customer's AK parts kit, is it required to have an O01 or O07 FFL to complete or repair the firearm? So in this question, we're going to presume that the question is the customer is, is asking the licensee to put the firearm together for them, and then it's going back to the customer. And the customer is a non-licensee, we presume. Yes. That can be done as an O-1 gunsmith. All right. Uh, if an O-7 FFL manufacturer brings their manufactured receiver to an O-1 FFL for fitting of a new barrel, and the barrel components. And after this process is completed, it's returned to the manufacturer for further completion of the weapon. 
for resale by the manufacturer is an 01 or 07 required by that FFL performing the process? So the FFL per performing this process would be doing so they're making the firearm suitable for use. So they would be required, and, and let me back up, not only are they making it suitable for use, but it is for sale or distribution. So that, that individual doing that service would need to be licensed as a manufacturer. However, they are not required to mark that firearm if it is already properly marked by the 07 manufacturer. They can adopt all the markings. Great. Uh, next question. With the new definition of gunsmith in the rule, if a manufacturer sends firearms to a gunsmith for further processing, such as decorative engraving, bluing, polishing, where the firearms go from the manufacturer to the gunsmith for the services, and then back to the manufacturer for sale, sale distribution to end users, must those gunsmiths now obtain a manufacturer type 07 or type 10 license? Again, they're making them suitable for use, for sale or distribution. Same thing, they would require an 07 manufacturer's license. Great, thank you. Uh, if an individual, so we're talking non-licensee, spray paints or covers their firearms specifically as an individual, not as a gunsmith. So we have an individual non-licensee performing these actions on their own firearm. Are they required to be licensed as a gunsmith or as a man? Or as a manufacturer. So since it's for their own, it's their own use, it's their firearms, they're not engaged in the business requiring a license. However, these individuals need to be mindful of the Gun Control Act, 18 USC 922K, and not to obliterate those serial numbers. All right. Uh, and this this question is dealing with licensing again. Um, the question reads, will the ATF allow home-based 01 FFLs to apply for an 07 without getting a full-blown zoning variance for all manufacturing types? For example, when I got my 01 FFL, I was told specifically I could not get an 07 because I was in a residential neighborhood because a home is not consistent with a manufacturing place of business. However, engraving, coating, et cetera, are things that gunsmiths do inside of their business all the time. If I am required to get an 07, will the ATF allow that in home-based FFLs with perhaps a restriction on types of manufacturing allowed? So under the GCA at 923D1, applicants and then subsequent licensees must uh, abide by state and local laws. So <clears throat> the issuance of an 07 license, that's a type of license ATF issues. If your state restricts your activity, and you comply with the state restrictions, then that's all you need to do. So that would be between you and the state and your local zoning office. If you can come to an agreement, have a restricted use uh, activity, we will issue the 07. All right, and one more follow-up question going from an 01 to an 07. If you are an 01 and want to go to an 07, do you need to submit another set of fingerprints? So that's a licensing question. Um, but if they have fingerprints and photographs on file, that will um, speed up the process of applying for that 07. Yeah, we're, gonna, we're gonna actually going to address that in a Q and A on our website. Yeah, in our in our FAQs that are coming out, we'll explain if you're gonna if you're uh, wishing to go to a different type of license, we'll include in there exactly what needs to be submitted. All right, we are now gonna cover some questions dealing with um, unfinished receivers. Um, please understand that in the industry, if you guys use the term 80%, um, we don't use that term here. So it's either a finished receiver or an unfinished receiver. So we'll do our best to, uh, to address those questions and, as well as some marking questions. All right, so a marking question, Bill. Uh, will previously approved marking variances stating that the manufacturer name will be molded inside the dust cover of a pistol frame to precede the final rule marking requirements. Will marking variances requesting that relief from the new marking requirements be approved along the same lines as previously approved marking variances? Okay, so a marking variance is an alternate means of identification. And uh, what that means is that that alternate means is reasonable and will not hinder the effective administration of the regulations. So a variance itself doesn't supersede a regulation. The regulation is what we look at to determine whether a variance can be granted or not. And so uh, 
that's that's just to to uh, to to uh, to start. Um, marking variances are still going to be looked at in the same way. Um, whether it, it 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 hinders the effective administration, and so um, as a, you know, in that way, and I can sort of, I think, get into maybe some other questions um, that that we've received uh, just briefly. Um, the variance procedures are still available, and so as far as you know, having enough space to mark on the uh, metal plate or things like that, you can still ask for variances to not put, for example. Uh, name, city, state, things like that on the metal plate. The serial number certainly must be, um, but we there there will be, I, I assume, uh, some variances addressed about putting other markings on the frame of receiver, just not on the metal plate. And so, long way of saying yes, the the variance procedures are still in place and we'll still look at, look at whether they hinder the effective administration of the regulation as it exists after the final, or after the effective date. Great, thank you. Uh, all right, another marking question. Where can we find approved marking requirements in the in the terms of methods, such as engraving requirements, laser, et cetera? There, the final rule doesn't talk about the methods used to um, place markings on the firearms. They have to meet the size and depth requirements. They can't be um, easily obliterated, things like that. But there is no standard for, um, you know, there's an approved or, or unapproved method of placing these markings on. They just have to meet the requirements that are in the final rule. The final rule doesn't go into more than that. It, the current rule doesn't go into more, more than that, honestly. Hey, next question. Can you provide more guidance about the grandfathering of markings and a new design that would trigger the new marking requirements? Sure, well, if, if you had a chance to look at the final rule, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll even give you the, the, the page of the Federal Register notice, which we have links for on the ATF webpage, 24743. Again, 24743 is the Federal Register page. What it states is that any frame or receiver with a new design manufactured after August 24th, 2022 must be marked with identifying uh, in, in information prescribed above. For purposes of this paragraph, the term new design means that the design of the existing frame or receiver has been functionally modified or altered as distinguished from cosmetic processes such as decoration. So if that receiver is being changed, um, that is something that would be considered a new design and the, and the new uh, or the final rule marking regulations would apply. Another marking question on Glock style semi-automatic pistols that use a polymer frame have insufficient space to include all of the information required for marking. ATF requiring we create larger metal plates to include this information, or can the extended info be in the polymer with only the serial number being on the metal? Obviously the serial number must be on the metal. Um, the the, the, the requirement is that it's on the metal. I do believe that it would be a variance uh, requirement to mark other parts. However, obviously, if it was all marked on that metal plate, the unremovable, non-removable metal plate, um, that, that would be sufficient under the rule. Okay. All right, now we got some questions on unfinished receivers versus okay. finished and weapons kits. All right, uh, if a parts kit does not include a frame or receiver, does it then apply to the rule? For example, trigger parts kits, barrels, et cetera. Well, it, it applies to the rule is, is, is what I'm struggling with. So the final rule talks about what is a frame or receiver. The assumption in the question is there is no frame or receiver, it's other parts. Yeah, I think maybe if we could talk about what is a, frame or receiver kit versus what is a weapons parts kit. Sure, so 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 the weapons parts kit, um, all those additional parts obviously that are required to be assembled into a complete weapon, if it doesn't include a frame or receiver, then it is just a parts kit. It isn't it's something that has to be um, marked serialized because there is no frame or receiver to mark or serialize at that point. Um, I suppose if, if the question is whether it is um, an unfinished item that is in that parts kit, 
if it is sold, shipped, possessed with, um, you know, or the seller makes available any of those items, such as the jigs, templates, again, the things explicitly set out in the regulatory text, question would be whether that's readily convertible. If it is, that item would be regulated as a firearm under the final rule. All right, so I have several more questions dealing with really the readily term. Okay. Uh, does the ATF take into account that a desktop CNC mill is not readily accessible to the average home builder for determining readily? Certainly the final rule doesn't get into any of the specifics about um, the advancing technology and things like that. However, that is something that, that would be considered in the future. So for example, if tomorrow um, or in 10 years, whatever it is, um, the technology was so available that everyone had one of these and it would be readily, then, then that could be considered. Right now, uh, what the final rule con considers and goes through in detail are the jigs, templates, things like that. Um, and so certainly readily is a term that is not, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's not stuck in time to what was readily in 1968 or 1948 or what have you. So that is an advancing term. But right now, the final rule talks about jigs, templates, things like that. Okay. Uh, we sell AR lower receivers that are only partially complete to the point where they don't need serials. We don't sell them as kits with tooling, jigs, parts kits, etc. If we do not sell the jigs, can we continue to sell these after the August 24th cutoff? So obviously referring to the effective date of the rule. Okay. So I'm I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna start my my answer with the word yes. You can continue to do that if all right. So what we're talking about is items that have not reached a stage of manufacture to be regulated as frames or receivers currently. Much of that will remain the same. And so, for example, um, if you are a company who who used to sell what was properly or or even marketed as an 80% receiver, something that had not reached a stage of man, man, manufacture, and you continue to do that after this, that, that is something that's still permissible. There is still such a thing as an item that has not reached a stage of manufacture to be considered a frame or receiver. The difficulty I'm having, and we always have answered this question is, 80% mean different things to different people. And so to say, yes, you can still sell 80% receivers or no, you cannot, um, we're relying on a marketing term, not a term actually defined in the regulations. Bottom line, you know, answer to the question is yes. If you are selling an item that has not reached a stage of manufacture and cannot readily be converted with the items you sell or make available, you can continue to do so. Uh, so along those lines, uh, an 80% AR lower, will that be considered a firearm? Again, 80% would be a marketing term, not a defined term. And so the idea would, would be the lower portion of the AR variant firearms will remain the frame or receiver. When that reaches a stage of manufacture, it would be regulated. Still, the fire control cavity um, is, is the critical component. Um, if, that's, if that's not milled, drilled, indexed, things like that, I expect that to stay the same. Um, further guidance on different types of firearms will be coming out from FATB. Um, so it, it is still possible to have a AR type firearm or another type of firearm that has not reached a stage of manufacture to be classified as a frame or receiver. Those are still possibilities. So folks that have these, what they're calling 80% receivers, they want to try and determine whether or not based on the final rule that is now a regulated item, they should refer to the regulatory text and review readily converted. Right. Um, and their other option is to uh, send the item to FATD for a classification. That's right. You can send it in. Um, FATD is currently at the Firearms Ammunition Technology Division is, is currently um, go, going through and they will provide more guidance. ATF will provide more guidance on specific types of firearms and what that stage of manufacture is under the final rule. All right. Um, this is, again, another marking question, but dealing with importations. Uh, it says, for the importing of frames, receivers, or firearms, we talked with the marking branch and we're told we could put in for a marking variance via letter to have our information on the items by the foreign manufacturer. I'm presuming they're saying the foreign manufacturer is going to mark the frame, receiver, or firearm. 
uh, just like a marking variance in the U.S., and it is okay to only have our mark have our markings on the item, but we must put who the items were imported from in our A and D record. So I think the question is, do they have to have the uh, foreign manufacturer markings on the firearms? Still a requirement under the final rule. Sorry, say so that one more time. Still a requirement under the final rule. Okay, so could you go over quickly just the requirements of what must be marked when it's being imported? Sure. So uh, the 47892 um, sets out all the marking requirements, uh, and it includes in the final rule on page 24741, um, for example, by engraving, casting, stamping, or otherwise conspicuously placing certain other information, model, caliber, gauge, when applicable, the name of the foreign manufacturer, and in the case of an imported firearm, the name of the country in which it was manufactured. So those specific requirements are in the final rule. Um, to get a variance from that, I suppose, is possible. I don't know what the marking branch, I, I'm, I'm assuming that's FATD. Um, you can get a variance from everything except for the statutory requirements. However, it's the discretion of FATD to grant that variance or not. Great, thank you. All right, a few, uh, we'll go over a few questions that just came in. Um, if an 07 assembles an AR-15 or variant receiver into a complete firearm for the purpose of reselling, can the barrel of the firearm still be marked with the 07's business name and city and state, or will the receiver and frame be the only valid place to mark after these changes go into effect? Well, I, sorry, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, there, there are so many variables um, that that play into it. And so, let me see here, let me pull up the regulatory text. And again, I'm, so I, I guess my question is, does the grandfather provision apply to this? And I just, I, I'm, I'm not sure under the facts of the scenario, whether this, this individual had been making these and is now grandfathered in, or if this is going to be after the effective date. And so, um, yeah, so, so, um, for, for very, very specific questions to your business, go ahead and, and email those to us at FIPD at ATF.gov and provide us all the information. So for instance, this particular question, if you could provide to us, uh, who are you, you know, the AR-15 or variant receiver that you're getting, what condition are you getting it? Who, who are you getting it from? Are those commercially manufactured? Are those finished receivers? Um, that kind of information would be very, very helpful. All right, let's see if there's a few other ones we can talk about real quick. saw a question on here, trying to find it. Uh, I believe somebody had a question about um, if you're an FFL and you personally, aside from your business, apart and separate from your business, have a, a firearm that you made yourself, do you have to serialize that? No, you don't. If it is not part of your business inventory, you do not have to mark it. If you choose at any time to enter that firearm into regulated commerce, either through yourself or another FFL, at that point, it would be it would require it to be marked. Uh, we've got a question, is a um, simple job of mounting a scope uh, require the weapon to be logged in and out of an A&D record, even if it is not yet the business premises for more than 24 hours? So simple job, mount a scope, does that have to go into their A&D record? I miss, missed the first part of it. Is okay. it Ben Smith? Uh, so the says a firearm is comes into an FFL gunsmith or manufacturer, but into an FFL an individual brings it in, asks for them to mount a scope to it. Does it have to be recorded in the A and D record? on one second. Okay, we're going to come back to that in just a second. Uh, someone asked if the Q and A's are being reported right now. They are not. Um, however, uh, we do, we are generating a frequently asked question list. 
And uh, I can assure you that the vast majority of the questions we're getting from these training sessions will be addressed in there. Um, we have upwards of 50 questions we're planning to put on there and we keep adding new ones in. But we will, um, we will certainly do our best to have all of these questions included on there. Um, another PMF related question, PMF comes in for gunsmithing and the serial number plate was engraved before and there is no space for the uh, FFLs number to be placed on there. Um, in that case, if you are unable, if the, if the PMF that's brought in is unable to be uh, properly marked, then you cannot take that firearm in. Uh, another question about record keeping, do existing A&D books need to be updated to reflect the new requirements? So the new requirements mean uh, being able to record uh, PMF as the uh, manufacturer, uh, both in the A&D record and on the 4473, uh, being able to record multiple serial numbers. Yes, your current A&D records are going to need to be updated to allow uh, for that record keeping. So if you are uh, utilizing electronic record keeping, uh, maybe through another software company, you're certainly gonna need to get with them to make sure that those columns are uh, correctly updated, okay? If I could, um, I, there, was a, there was a question on the um, Sig Sauer grip module becoming the frame or receiver. Um, this is something that's specifically addressed in the final rule. Um, and there's actually a picture of the item uh, in 478.12. Um, and what it talks about, it, if, if you had a chance to look at the final rule, are those are those SIG models with the chassis? Then the chassis is specifically the frame. So again, a picture explicitly stating what is the frame or receiver. Um, hopefully that will address many of the questions we get on the frame or receiver, but, but again, that SIG chassis system is specifically included in the final rule. All right, now circling back to the question about um, mounting a scope on a firearm um, in which that activity you're saying would take less than 24 hours. So the only time a firearm is not required to be uh, entered into the A&D record is for minor adjustments or repairs that will not require the firearm to stay overnight. Uh, whether or not we would consider mounting a scope to be a minor adjustment or repair, uh, we are talking about right now and we will make that part of our FAQ. So again, the regulations state that firearms brought in for minor adjustment or repair that will not stay overnight and will go back to the same person uh, those are the only instances in which that firearm does not have to be recorded in the A&D record. Again, firearm brought in for gunsmithing purposes uh, that stays overnight, goes in the book, uh, but there is no 4473 uh, that needs to be done if it's going back to the same person who brought it in. If it's going back to somebody else, then a 4473 will need to be completed. Um, there was another question um, regarding multi, the marking of multi-piece frames and receivers specifically. Is the serial number the same on all parts of it? Um, again, on page 24741 of the Federal Register Notice, 24741, talks about multi-piece frames or receivers. And what it says is if more than one subpart, so more than one half or quarter of it, whatever it is, is similarly designed to house, hold, or contain the primary components, so the fire control component, the bolt, whatever it is, each of those subparts must be identified with the same serial number and associated license information. And so again, that answer is specifically addressed in the text of the regulation. All right, we got a couple more questions. Uh... If a, if, they meet, uh, PMF, if a PMF comes in that the individual built and put his own serial number on it, will I as an FFL have to re-serialize the receiver? Uh, okay, so if, if, you, if an individual brings in uh, a PMF, uh, obviously that they made, um, and they put their serial number on it, you will still have to put your FFL number in front of it, that, that first three and last five, 
um, that will need to go immediately before uh, the number that they serialize on it with a hyphen in between that. So it'll be your first three, last five of your serial number, a hyphen, and then uh, that the number that they placed on there. Again, this is for tracing purposes. Um, the individual is nice enough to put a serial number on it, but we it, we don't have any other identifying information. That's why we need your FFL number. So we can simply, if that firearm is ever recovered, we can uh, at least come to you to say, hey, who did you dispose of that firearm to? So again, yes, you have to put your FFL number in front of it. Um, all right, and last question. It says, when an individual brings in an SPR built pursuant to an approved form one to an engraver, for marking, does the engraver need to also include their FFL number in the engraving? No. No, it's exempted right, right in the form one. Right. So it, it's a since it is a um, SBR, it's on a form one. Um, that firearm is already traceable based on the markings that are put on it. It does not have to have your FFL number on there. All right, that concludes the uh, the training today. Like I said, we have another training session at 2 p.m. It will be the exact same material that was presented this morning. Um, you are certainly welcome to attend the afternoon session, especially if you were unable to get into uh, the session when we began this morning. It's, it will be the exact same link. So again, thank you all. Um, please go to our website, access all this material as, as well as the regulatory text. Thank you.